Hi there, thank you for having me. My name is Amada Marcus Simula, and I'm the mayor of Columbia Heights, Minnesota. I just wanna take a moment to say thank you to SOCAP and Spectrum for inviting me to this. I'm so glad they're making space and time for a gathering of this kind and just think it's very important. So thank you all for being here and, um, and listening. So as I said, my name is Amada Marcus Simula. I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. I moved to, I went to eight different schools and I grew up at, eventually at a hobby farm in a small town. Uh, our graduating class was 90 people. So it was pretty small. Um, and during all those moves, I was almost all the time the only brown skin person in our school. Um, I was the only person with the name Amada and I had to reintroduce myself or introduce myself every time we moved. Um, people didn't understand why my name was pronounced the way it was pronounced and had just had to go through a lot of that. For those of you who have a different spelling name or, um, or pronunciation from what people are expecting, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that was, that was a, a difficult journey, let me say. Um, but also as a kid, I was a Girl Scout and in a really great troop. And that's where I really learned to give back to my community. And I learned, learned about civic, civic service. Um, one of the things in Girl Scouts is being a sister to every Girl Scout. So being a sister to all women, you always should support women, no matter what. And then um, making the world a better place. That's the a main goal of Girl Scouts. And it really has set with me until this day. Every day, that is a goal of mine is, am I making the world a better place? Is this conversation helping make the world a better place? I'm not saying it happens all the time. But it is my goal every day is to make the world a better place. Um, one of the things I've done in that is being a neighborhood block captain. So as an adult, everywhere I've lived, and I've lived in, I think, five different states now, um, I've always become the neighborhood block captain. This is something that anyone can do. You, um, in our city, at least, in most cities, it is coordinated through the police department. And... Um, you just sign up and you're the neighborhood watch captain or um, a block captain. But the great thing about this is, is that you have a chance to organize a block party. And um, of course this is pre-pandemic, but the neighbors get to know each other. And in my own neighborhood, I've lived here for seven years. I have neighbors that had lived next door to each other for 23 years and had never met. They had waved to each other. They had shoveled each other's driveways and helped you know, push their car out of the snow. This is Minnesota, it does happen in the winter. But um, they had actually never met until this block party, 23 years after they'd moved next door to each other. So really getting together with your neighbors is a great way to be involved in the community. Um, as, as I've lived here in Columbia Heights, I have been working to um, get to know the neighbors, as I said. And as mayor, my goal is to make our city government and our staff um, representative of our community and really making the time to see people as leaders. So seeing women, seeing people of color, women of color as leaders and asking them to step up. I worked on um, a pride festival that we had here in town, our very first pride festival in 2019. Um, it was a great event. It was a time of um, many people who came to the event saying to me, I didn't know there were other people in town who were, who were LGBTQ. I thought I was the only gay person in town. And now I have many friends who are friends with each other because they met and found out what a diverse city we are and, and a place that is becoming more and more representative of the whole world. And so I'm really pushing as mayor to make sure that our um, staffing um, searches are, we're looking for more spaces to, um, to reach out to for hiring. We're also looking to our community more to, to make sure our, our commissions and boards are being more representative. So one of the things is, is seeing people, like I said, as leaders and asking them. And as I campaigned last summer, I got to know a lot of people and I would, and I, and I could see this in them. You know, you're, you are, you are a leader in your community. We have a very large Somali community here. Um, I met a coach who was very involved, very involved with um, kids, families, with his, with his coaching and asked him, please, would you step up and, and um, join one of our, our pork boards? Um, and I'm hoping that can happen. We have, um, you know, women who are doing so much with the schools and asking them, can you step up and be on the school board? Um, you know, just really making sure that, that people know that they are seen this way. Um, statistically, when, um, 
men, specifically more white men run for government is statistic. I mean, I just say statistically, cause I don't want it to sound like I'm just saying this, but they usually run because they thought they would just run. Whereas women, women of color, people of color and people in the LGBTQ community are leaders and people have asked them, please run for office, please represent us. And uh, this would happen for me. I had thought of running before, but after I worked in the Pride Festival, many people said, please run, please be our mayor. I wanna see someone like you be our mayor. And um, thankfully when I ran last year, I had a great campaign team. Um, lots of people in the community wanted to work on the campaign and get me in that seat. And um, I would say, if you ever have a chance, um, if someone just speaks to you and they are working for the goals you want in your community and your you know, state, your country, volunteer for them, do phone banking. It's not that hard. Um, it's a lot of fun as well. And you get to be a part of you know, how these things work and how we can create change. Um, so definitely get involved in that way. But before I end our time here, I wanna make sure that I give you guys a couple calls to action. So I actually have three three calls to action for you to go off in the rest of your day and, um, and take up the time to, to um, make the world a better place. So first one is get to know your neighbors. You live in an apartment, you know, condos, house, houseboat, tree house, you know, get to know your neighbors. Um, if you can't go visit them with the pandemic, you can write them a card. Just give them your phone number, your email and say, I just want to know if, if I can ever help you out. Let me know, um, you know, if I, leave the outside faucet on, you know, maybe we can uh, turn each other's faucet off or let me know if the garage door is left open. Um, so get to know your neighbors. The second thing, as I said before, is see women, see women of color, see people of color, see people with disabilities, see the LGBTQ community and people as leaders and ask them to run and then support them. Be there to support them. Women who are running, tell them, you know, I'll pick up the kids from soccer. I'll drop off a meal. Um, if you know, I'll mow your lawn. You get out there and campaign. So if you can't donate, you can help out in that way. And then the last thing I'll say is, and as I said at the beginning, my name is Amada, Amada Marcus Simula. Learn to say people's names correctly. Your colleagues, your friends, learn to say their name. Do the work for yourself. Go on YouTube and look up how to pronounce this name. Most names are there. Um, and learn it. You need to make yourself learn how to say their names correctly. People deserve that respect and you can do it. You can do it. There's a few, a few names maybe that you'll have a hard time, but you know what? Keep trying. And, um, and if you make a mistake, just say, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. I'll try again. You do not need to say things like, oh, I'll never get it or I'll butcher it. So try to say people's names correctly and keep trying. But thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a great rest of your gathering. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Yui Scribner and I'm an investor and head of operations at Impact America Fund, an impact venture capital firm whose mission is to increase economic agency for communities of color in the US. When Carrie emailed me about this session, she asked if I had a provocation that I would like to share. And I thought about this, especially in the context of the theme of this session to ensure collective gains are sustained among women. To me, that's about structural change and that's a big, bold goal. And whenever I'm faced with a big task, I try to narrow my focus down to the day-to-day -day work of getting it done that often boils down to the boring process questions that no one gets terribly excited about because change is supposed to be about big vision and blue skies. But I think the unsexy in the weeds question of how does something get done, that's the killer question. It's how we get from here to there. It's the key to turning intention and effort into lasting change. So let me tell you a little bit about how I came to anchoring my time and work around this central question. I came to impact investing in VC just a few years ago. Prior to this, my career had been in the federal government and the law, corporate America in media and entertainment, and Silicon Valley in product development and data analytics. 
while different in many ways, there was a common thread among these experiences, and that's that they were filled with a strong sense of mission. Vision statements were everywhere you looked. Leaders would recite company values at all hands meetings. They were plastered on every presentation and piece of marketing material. The mission was always big and bold, and it was also often about change. People were moved and motivated by it. It felt good to be bound together by a common purpose. But at times, these statements could also feel like empty slogans, things that we reflexively stamped onto documents, or worse, work that was already being done or choices that we otherwise wanted to make that were then shoehorned into something that looked and sounded like they were born out of the big picture mission. As a company grows and expands, I think it's natural for leadership to reach for first principles even if they've become watered down with time. But the places where I saw the strongest expression of the mission were in places where people and teams were more focused on how that mission translates to the work at hand. And I learned how a lack of attention to how things get done can lead to good intentions that go awry in practice. I carry these lessons with me into my work today. So let me tell you a little bit about that. As I said at the beginning, Impact America Fund is an impact VC firm. Our vision is for a future where people of color experience true agency and participation in the American economy. That's important and it's absolutely our North Star, but how do we get there? Well, first we ask ourselves how we want to express that vision into the actions and tasks that we do every day. From the mundane, like how we take and share notes, to how we run our entire diligence process. And you won't be surprised to hear we look for founders who are also really caring about how they're building their businesses, not just what they're building or how big. These founders are challenging the status quo that says that a gig worker can't be paid a living wage, or a janitor isn't right for a tech sector job, or an undocumented small business owner isn't investable. And they're hyper-focused on how to turn that insight into a series of many, many more hows, how to tackle this challenge and the one after that and the next one after that in very complex entrenched industries. Without focus, these founders wouldn't have much more than a, without that focus, these founders wouldn't have much more than a vision statement or a great idea. And allow me to say this, great ideas and a big vision are terrific. They're absolutely the spark and center of gravity needed to make big things happen. I work for a visionary named Keisha Cash, and without her and all the other visionaries in the audience and the dreams that they're courageous enough to dream, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for your courage and foresight and brilliance. But how do we make that vision a reality? How do we do it in a way that stays true to the original intent? Because of course, we've all seen cases in the business world and in the tech world where big ideas and large scale visions can lead to unintended consequences that disproportionately affect marginalized communities. In our recent history, an emphasis on vision and disruption without enough focus on how we get there has led to bad outcomes for workers, for our privacy, and even for our public safety. When these platforms were being built, what if someone had asked, how will this impact our workers? How do we scale this in a way that still protects user privacy? How do we connect shared interests without amplifying or activating hate? People inside those companies probably did ask those questions, but maybe not enough and not enough of us investors did either. And the same for users and customers. Setting ambitious goals without regard for how we achieve them has turned into a failed playbook. And we all have to start inquiring as to how things are made and done if we're to uphold our values and our common interests. But avoiding these outcomes isn't the only reason to ask ourselves how a thing should get done. There are many good affirmative reasons why I try to anchor myself on this question every day. Asking how takes us out of the past and into the future. 
faced with a problem, it orients us toward the opportunities and the solutions rather than the challenges and barriers. Asking how also assumes you're in this effort with me, whereas why is about convincing people to join it. And as I said before, I think focusing on how things work is the only way we get to real structural change that's scalable and that's lasting. Maybe that's hyperbolic or more likely that's boring, but in the political arena, you see it all the time. Strip away the rhetoric and headlines and you'll see examples like gerrymandering or the filibuster of ways that the process of how things get done, how they're counted or how votes are cast, translates into tremendous and enduring political power. We may want our systems to work better, but without examining how the work gets done, we can only hope for incremental and isolated incidents of progress. So my challenge to you is this, center your day-to-day -day work around how you carry out your mission. Spend as much time leading discussions on how as you do on why. Why is an important and foundational question, but it can be limiting. There is a reason why psychologists are discouraged from asking their patients why questions, because why did something happen tends to take us backwards and closed off to learning, or it leads to over-intellectualized or abstract answers rather than ones that are grounded in concrete examples and actions. I've seen the same effect in our line of work, and that leads to distance from our communities that we serve and consensus around edicts that have little or no teeth. So pivot from why to how quickly and lean into a string of hows. How will we do this might lead to how will we know it's working might lead to how will stakeholders react. Opportunities often lie in those lines of inquiry. So do important flags or risks or misalignment on your team. And consider including the how when defining what success looks like. A year ago, I heard a veteran ESG investor talk about this idea in the context of how she evaluates a company for investment. She made the point that while the same choice to let go of a certain number of staff taken by two CEOs might appear the same on their PNL, asking how those cuts were carried out were they done by the CEO or by a consultant, would reveal much more about the business fundamentals, resilience, and long-term value of that company. And finally, I hope this is something you can begin to try right away, and that is incorporate small hows into your daily work. If your company says they care about equity and inclusion, they're likely starting with hiring to get better representation among their ranks. That's super important but you may not be a hiring manager or your team may be fully staffed at the moment. If you and your team care about these values, how might you embody them as you move through your day and week? What about in your next meeting, asking yourself whose voice is missing from this conversation? How do I get that perspective into the room? And how do I support that person when they're on the inside? In closing, let me leave you with one final thought. As women, I think we're really adept at homing in on this question of how, because at its core, caring about how something is done is exactly that, an act of caring. And I believe deeply that women, especially when working together, are force multipliers in their communities. So let's come together point ourselves at the big thorny problems and keep asking ourselves how. Thank you. Thank you to you both for those powerful words. And we're gonna engage in a little bit of Q&A at this time. So if we can bring back um, Madam Mayor and Yui to the stage, we're gonna get started. I know that uh, Madam Mayor is in the audience, so perhaps we can work on getting her in. But in the meantime, I'll start with a question for you, Yui, and then when the mayor joins us, she can respond as well. So we know 
good and well that whenever there's movement towards progress and justice, there is a backlash. And not only a backlash, sometimes there's retrenchment, sometimes there's reversion to the mean, sometimes people are in outright attack. Historical record has proven that. So when we think about these gains that we're making and these shifts that you're talking about that we need to make, how do we ensure that they are durable? And how do we also come prepared to fight to keep our gains and defend these goals that, um, you know, that we're sharing today? Do you have some thoughts on that too, particularly in, in your domain of around investing practice? Thank you, uh, Monique, and uh, thank you everyone for, for organizing this event and, and for being here. Um, you know, that's a hard question, and I think something that we at Impact America Fund ask ourselves every day, uh, and, and I know, you know, elsewhere in the field as well. Um, I know I, I, my whole talk was focused on the question how, but I think it's important to stress um, that the foundational question really starts with why. Um, and, and really setting that intent uh, and coming back to it over and over again. Um, how is this working in the context of the intent that we set out, I think is really important and really important to keeping ourselves durable and resilient uh, in the long fight. I'd also say, you know, when I think about the big problems and the big challenges, um, I really try to focus on how do I pivot that into a how? And the two ways that I really think about doing this uh, is starting small and getting proximate. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Starting small, I think, um, really means breaking down these big problems into bite-sized steps, right? And by breaking it down into those steps, you're orienting yourselves already to how are we gonna get it done and how we're gonna keep that endurance, that durability, that resilience, that sustaining momentum which is part of the why that you're pointing out, Monique. You know, they say, I think, uh, when they say, you know, come up with a list of things you need to do, they say, don't write, write a book, don't write the big thing, write the smallest possible thing, right? Write, uh, write an outline for my book, or even better, write a paragraph on anything at all. Um, and I try to hold that in my mind so that I don't get paralyzed by the big challenge, um, so that I keep moving with intention and so that I can keep checking in my, with myself, with ourselves on the progress as we do these incremental hows. I think also, you know, this idea of getting proximate, obviously this is something that Brian Stevenson, the civil rights leader talks about a lot. Uh, and he says, get proximate to those who are suffering because we can't create justice without getting close to the places where injustices prevail. And I think that's really important um, as an anchor as we move through this work. But I'd humbly add uh, to Mr. Stevenson um, that you also can't see the solutions, uh, the durability, the resilience, um, if you're not proximate, if you're not proximate to community, if you're not proximate to the women you're trying to serve, to the women of color who are doing amazing things on the ground within their communities, within their fields. Mm -hmm. um, People and communities have their own solutions. Uh, you know, we don't have to make them up in a, every tower or in a mm -hmm. library, you know, surrounded by books and research. That's important, uh, but really starting inside of community on the ground and getting proximate to the challenges and the opportunities, I think is the way that we build a really strong foundation from the ground up. Um, we can learn a lot from how a single mother manages her day uh, and her work and balances it against uh, her parenting duties. Uh, we can learn a lot from how a small business owner plans inventory for the week or the month. Um, there are real innovations and solutions inside of those lived experiences. And we really try to anchor that um, in our everyday work at Impact America Fund. And I think that's, that's the bedrock. Um, that's the thing that's really hard to, to change and, and, and the strength that we'll draw um, against any future backlash. Thank you for thank that, you. and Madam Mayor, thank you for hopping on with us here again. Um, I don't know if you heard the earlier part of the question, you know, the, part, the point is um, related to the backlash and potentially attack on the gains that we have made. And of course, in democracy, there's been quite a lot of movement and quite a lot of attention to all these things that are happening now. I'd love to hear your take on how we make these, how we fight 
the voter suppression that we're seeing and all these other attacks that we have on these gains that are certainly going to disproportionately affect people of color and women and other marginalized people. And we'd love to hear your take on what we can do to be thoughtful around how do we create these durable changes and, and protect them as we make them? Yes, uh, great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm really working through, um, I'm in Columbia Heights, which is um, right next to Minneapolis. And so we have the Derek Chauvin trial happening right now. And so it's it's not my neighborhood, but it's literally like, you know, blocks blocks away. And um, and of course, it, 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 this is impacting the whole world. It's not Minneapolis, it's not Minnesota, it's not the United States, it's everywhere. Um, so we're having, you know, everyone is is working through these feelings of anger and hurt and disappointment and uh, resentment and fear. Um, and so I'm really leaning into um, into kindness and compassion for myself. And I um, I don't have the quote off the top of my head, but but self care, you know, is an is an is an act of, of resistance, uh, an act of resistance. Yes. And um, yesterday I took a mental health day. I just I needed it. And this weekend we have a big um, town hall on healing. And I have a lot of um, different pastors speaking and people from the community, um, very diverse group of people. It's outdoors. And, and the idea is, is that we can come together and um, just not feel alone, especially during this pandemic. But I think knowing we need to heal, we need to take time for ourselves, have compassion with ourselves so we can come back and fight because, because the, um, the system is not going to give this to us easily. And we all know this already. People have known this for hundreds of years, and um, and it is tiring. You know, it, it is it is un, un unrelenting. And um, so I think acknowledging that, um, having people that you can rely on, that you can be honest with, and talk about your fears, but then knowing that um, we can do hard things, uh, we can keep going, but but it is just going to be hard. I think just acknowledging how difficult it is and how tired. Um, people are, and then, and then, of course, when people are tired and hurting, you know, people um, can lash out. Mm -hmm. And um, understanding that sometimes when our friends or our community members lash out, that we can, um, we can almost be thankful that they're sharing those raw feelings with us, that they trust us enough to be what they needed to be in that moment, even though it's hard on our end. Um, I think trying to to give that grace um, that if that's what happens, that trying to look past that too, so we can extend grace to each other. Particularly in the pandemic, my line has been grace and space because you don't know what folks are going through. Um, and just to pivot a little bit to your how question, Yui, that you theme for your talk, and actually, um, Madam Mayor, your call to action are essentially about accountability too. So when we think about accountability, we often hold ourselves as women more closely into higher bars. And we fail often to look at the system and to look up. How do we hold those in power and the systems accountable? When the one thing that I am often think about is how do we make the invisible systems visible in ways that we can actually point to them, we can name them, we can then do something about them when we do so. And um, really accountability for me is my, my word for 2021. There's so many levels to what needs to be held accountable, what, who needs to be held accountable, what needs to be held accountable, and how measuring and managing even our small minor actions is one aspect of it. But then there's so many levels um, to, the, to the civic institutions that we hold dear and to those big powerful ones, um, organizations small and big, the ones we work for, and those who run things. Um, you can take it in any way you'd like to go with that question around just accountability for the self, but also ensuring we are looking up and outwards. Um, maybe Madam Mayor will go to you first and then we'll turn to you, Yui. Sure. One of the ways that I'm in the, in the position the elected official that I am right now is um, bringing more information about how our council meetings happen and our work sessions um, to throw light on it. Um, these things, you know, yes, they're all open meetings. Yes, you know, there's a link on a website, but for everyone to find that, you know, people are living their lives. They're not, they're not wondering about these things. And generally, you know, until, until there's a problem, people don't 
don't really pay attention to what's happening. And that's that's just the norm, um, which then means things go under the radar and then things people all of a sudden say, how did this even happen? So really trying to shed a light on how the system works because the more people who can see how it is working, um, that how question, um, then they can start just to push, just to shine a light on it and say, well, maybe why is it this way? Do we have to continue it this way? Um, and especially when we're trying to create create systems where we're being more inclusive and welcoming to people who are not the the cultural norm that's been in elected office, um, in order to be ready for that, we're going to have to rethink things. Um, yeah, I think of people with disabilities that come into it, people who don't speak English as a second language. You know, our our interview questions are are difficult. These are people who are greatly um, you know, greatly bringing richness to our communities. But if we set up these parameters of, you know, interviews, questions and such, and it makes it more difficult, we're, we're losing out on having them join us. So I think really shining a light on things, how did this happen? And then why is it still this way? Is there a way we can change things? Thank you for those answers, really appreciate it. And Yui? Yeah, th thank you for that, Mayor Amada. And, and I think just to build off what you said, for me, it's you know two things. One, I try to just keep asking questions uh, unsurprisingly. Um, and I try to formulate and really get in the habit of making every question a how question because I actually think a what or a why or a who, when framed as a how, puts you and other people in the driver's seat. It's about accountability and action. Um, what should be done is a passive question. Um, how can we address this, right, is, is an action and accountability oriented question. Who's an expert on this topic? Uh, I try to reframe as how can I learn more about this or how can we learn more about this or how can you learn more about this if we're talking about, you know, holding other folks feet to the fire. Um, and, and putting us and I and we and you in the game and in the conversation, I think is really important um, and really the kernel of, a, uh, of the beginning of accountability. And that takes me to, I think, the second thing that I really try to think about and create space for um, and where you know, a lot of power lies and that's in collaboration and coalition building. I think women in particular, I think marginalized communities in particular, are really good at community building, are really good at finding their collective power. Um, and I think that's how we build bulwarks and we build strength um, to hold both ourselves uh, accountable to our intent and how we're doing things, but also others accountable as they come into the conversation, as they bring their capital into the conversation. Such wise words from you both. We so very much appreciate you having having joining us today, having you here. We will take your words and your insight and hopefully hold that with us as we move forward in order to deliver on those goals that you mentioned. And I'll just recap, Miramata, your uh, calls to action. Get to know your neighbors, see women as leaders and ask them to run and support them. Let's double down on that and learn to say people's names correctly. I think that's beautiful. I try to, I hope that I pronounced your name correctly today. <laughs> And Yui, uh, thank you also for your calls to action around reframing words to how. I think that will drive action. And we are so grateful for both of your insights. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly today too, Yui. You and did. We are grateful for you to join us and look forward to hearing more from you in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. And I will turn it back to Halima.